Hey. This is getting a little weird to have uh, no consultation before the backdrop and still we're twice in a row kind of similar. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we, we got the same mindset. You know, it's the, the weather outside. The weather's beautiful, you know. So I love this weather. Fall and spring are great with fall being a little better for me. You know, I just absolutely love it. But the, the one thing I hate about this time of year is you never know what's going to happen. You know, yeah, I wake up this morning at 66. Okay, I put on a shirt and jeans and that. This afternoon, I go outside. I'm going to work in the yard. Oh, it's 75, 80 degrees. Now I got to change into shorts and stuff. And then it cools down for dinner in the evening. I go back out. I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's chilly. The sun's down. And I, why? Why? Where's Apple working on this for the watch? I won't be able to hit my watch and my clothes adjust to, okay, now it's warmer clothes. And blah, 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 now it's cooler. What's wrong with Apple? Why haven't they done that yet? <laughs> You know that's in version 16. You know that's, Oh, yeah. That's We're only on back. version uh, 2,727 right now, right? <laughs> We're going to move up to uh, unstable molecules like the Fantastic Four used to have with their uniforms. And you can just like, you know, hey, I think I'll have shorts. And then things kind of redistribute themselves on your body. So. Exactly. I've seen it in the movies, so it must exist, right? <laughs> I think so. So, And actually, it, I, I'm also... I love the fall because I love the colors. I really love the changing yeah. leaves and stuff like that. And uh, Colleen, for instance, we're, we're going to be going up to Toronto for our Just for Laughs festival. But while we're there, we're like, man, we I don't want to just be in the city. So at least one day, we're going to take a break from comedy and head up north towards Tobermory and Georgian Bay. And, and that there's a beautiful a bunch of hiking, a bunch of just getting Toronto. You have to do a little bit of driving to get outside of the city because it's really a megalopolis. And yet, once you get up there, like leaves are changing more uh, earlier in the year than they are here. So at one point with, we went on a, a wonderful getaway week with a bunch of friends to a, uh, a chalet that we rented in Quebec City, outside of Quebec City, the Chalet des Bois Monde, and the most beautiful leaves we've ever seen. And it's kind of funny, I, I a lot of it was eating together, gaming together, that kind of stuff. But I was determined while I'm up there, like, they have provincial parks or national parks, just like we do. So we went to Algonquin and a bunch of other places and the most beautiful leaves we've ever seen, like everywhere you look, you know, you go, you go, there's a bridge across this river and you go out to the bridge and it's just like being surrounded by this bowl of tricks, these incredible bold colors and stuff like that. What we also discovered was that Canadians, maybe Europeans also are hardier than the United States. You know, we went to the, the ranger desk at various different lodges where you first go in, there was a welcoming center and said, so, hey, we're looking for like a good two to four hour hike, you know, uh, easy going to medium. And he said, well, this is kind of an easy one. And it turned out to be one where it was like using chains to climb along rocky faces of stuff and everything like that. And there really was elevation gain and loss. And there were places like they have the, play, uh, the, the trails relatively well marked with flashes on the trees and stuff. But there were a couple places where maybe because we went on ones that weren't as popular, I would have thought late in the season, they would have been tromped down a lot. We had places where just you're walking on something that's maybe like this wide, you know what I mean? And, and just, it was, wow, they earned their pea meal bacon and their, you know, maple syrup up here because we really worked. And also, I know I'm going on too long. I was getting a little bit sick. And it's amazing how when you're getting sick, your energy reserves of your body are being kind of dedicated to fighting off the sniffles that you're getting and stuff like that, instead of, you know, kind of singing your marching songs and stuff. And I just was continually falling behind. And I don't do that. I usually am really hardy when I go walking. And, and I, so I have these wonderful memories of how beautiful it was, but every other part of that trip was like, man, I'm, I'm falling behind here. And in fact, we had intended after this thing to then go to Montreal for a couple of days, just Colleen and I and get to know the city and stuff like that. And we got to the outskirts of Montreal. And honestly, we're like, I kind of like looked up at Colleen at lunch and I said, I really need to like crash. I need to go home. I am so, it was beyond snotty at that point. I really was flu -y. And we went to a little Canadian dispensary, not, not that that dispensary has a very particular name nowadays but like you know whatever it is where you can get canadian drugs found something that was like i think this is flu relief theraflu type stuff up in quebec everything is labeled both american and, and french 
American, English and French. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But like I, we drove from there like 10 hours, 12 hours to get home just because I didn't want to sleep in a hotel room. I didn't want to be Colleen is bursting with energy and ready to go do things. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. So <laughs> it, it, I have, I really, it's kind of funny, you know, how your mind does memory things. I have such fond memories of that trip but I was in crappy shape for like two thirds of it. And I just remember the wonderful bright spots and kind of, you push those other things yeah. until I talk about it. Now you push them out of your mind. You yeah. Know? So. yeah. That's how me and the kids are with our Disney trip. Uh, there was actually a typhoon traveling across the state and it oh, rained every day. Uh, but we don't even remember that. You know, there's, uh, I remember more than they do. They were 10 and 12. So. And, and okay. the hiking, one of my favorite hiking memories was down in the Blue Ridge, somewhere in West Virginia, okay. where we're hiking along this trail, you know, our backpacks on. This was scouts. So we were traveling camp to camp. Yeah. And there was a spot where the rhododendron was grown so heavy and lush, they had to cut a path through it. So it was like a tunnel of rhododendron all around us. And that was really cool. Yeah, in fact, exactly. Uh, we've been hiking a number of times down in Smoky Mountain, Great Smoky Mountain National Park and, and that same Blue Ridge Parkway and along there. And they have what they call balls. It's the, their mountains are not that tall. So you get to the top and it's kind of just a rounded surface, but, and it's not, I think it's above the tree line, but not above the rhododendron line. And so you get <laughs> there and like you said, here's the trail and you're like having to work your way through a maze. You know what I mean? They don't yeah. maintain it. They don't, they, they're, they had cut a, a nice tunnel for you. I remember going up there like, man, I, <laughs> I, I, you get to where it's like, you can't even see the sky. So you can't orient as to where right. the sun is. You kind of can, because there's more sunlight coming from one direction or the other. It's like, you know, I hope we head down off the mountain the correct way here because it was so <laughs> easy to get turned around in this. Yeah. Yeah. People even don't realize even, you know, the, the, there's not as many now, but even hiking with trails and marks and stuff, it, it is easy sometimes if you're not used to the woods to get turned around and then kind of freak out. And, you know, that doesn't help. And, yeah. and we always learn wilderness survival, which in certain circumstances is good. But really, most of these uh, common paths that people take in the national parks, you're not going to be lost for four or five days with somebody right. with ser- dogs and helicopters searching for you. Exactly. you you're literally probably a hundred <laughs> feet away from some other trail or people at almost all times. You That's know? right. We, we have Colleen and I go hiking. We like going on like big, long, you know, all day from eight in the morning till six at night. And, and so we have our maps and nowadays, as you said, not only, um, the way the trails are set up and well marked, but with a GPS and everything, you usually can kind of keep track of where you are, where we are. Having said that, like early days where you could get maybe you could get signal, but the GPS couldn't reach everywhere because they didn't have it. We went to Harney Peak, which is the highest peak in between the Rockies and the Pyrenees over in Europe. Nothing in the Appalachians or the Adirondacks, uh, uh, none of that matches. So we're all the way up there, and we had a good trail guide that kind of says you know in three quarters of a mile you'll see the three sisters and we got where we took a bad fork on the trail and continued to have that looks like the three sisters that looks like the beehives that looks like you know uh, the old man of the mountain and then we realized when we got to like the edge of i think it was the black hawk or blackfoot national preserve or something like that it's like wow this is way afield from where we should be and I think I might have mentioned this little story before. I was foolish in that I had I had my usual sunscreen shirt. You know, I have a, 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 a thing that has SPF built into it. But underneath that, I had a like a cotton, maybe even a polo shirt or something like that. Well, what's the, the trail saying? Cotton is rotten and should best be forgotten because it doesn't wick moisture away from your skin like wool does. Right. It keeps it right on there. And if you have too much surface area with water, it wicks away your heat. And I got hypothermia for the first time in my life i had never gotten it before so i could tell i was kind of getting goofy i was repeating myself i was um like i'd read the trail guide and do this thing and then colleen had to kind of take over and so there i i I still had my animal strength i kept going no matter what but she i was kind of an automaton and she just kept you know we we discussed and found a way to go through this wilderness to where we got to a road and classically we had gone too wrong too far so that now night was falling and you don't want to be in the woods at night you know it's not quite 
X Files where they really made the woods to be a spooky <laughs> place and stuff like that. I'm not expecting, you know, werewolves or aliens or anything like that. And nonetheless, even though in our backpack we've got water we've got the little um blankets you know, the the foil blankets that really retain your body heat and yet we don't want to huddle and hope that etc cetera, etc cetera. so when we got to a certain place and saw heard the the sound of cars and it's like well all we have to do is get to a road and then we can you know thumb it and say have mercy on us for bedraggled but we broke out of the forest yeah because everybody stops for the six and a half foot tall linebacker <laughs> and, 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 and luck, luckily i have a uh, colleen as my uh, ameliorating factor you know and i mean i don't think they think that she's my captive please take us in the car but instead so we actually we got on out of this road and there was light in the distance so we got to where there was a like an outfitter store if you will but it was closed for the day and so like i'm i'm planning on you know we could stay in the bathrooms no it's all concrete that'll take your heat away again you know if i have to i'm going to pick up that trash can and crash through that glass and we're going inside and getting a sleeping bag and i'll pay for the damages <laughs> luckily at this place they had enough wi-fi and signal that we were able to call the park ranger and he came and got us and it took him 45 minutes to get to our car that's how wrong we had gone literally well, almost opposite direction and you know those kind of hiking roads they're not straight you kind of got to wind and follow yeah. the tours of the mountain but man we got back to the room after being saved and getting to our car and stuff like that and i had like grapes and triscuits to replace liquids and to just have uh, the, the, I, I never felt so happy to be in a room with a lock on the door and a bed to sleep on. The prospects two hours ago had been, I'm going to be sleeping on like, a, maybe we'll find a place where a deer had slept and they had tamped down the grass for us. But otherwise. Right. Well, you know, that, that, that whole 45 minutes and, you know, what people also need to realize, they, they try to keep these parks and stuff pretty untouched with as much as possible so there aren't roads through the middle of a lot of this so you might have driven 12 15 miles around or 20 miles or, or, but That's you right. were really yeah. only like a mile and a half straight on it's just trying to get through the woods it's a mile and a half as the crow flies but up and down right. trails and around mountains it could have been five six miles yeah. Uh, but but actually what i what i did do is of course the next day i pulled out we have topo maps we always prepare ourselves and then i looked at well here's where our car was parked and you know as you do this here's where our car was parked and here's where we went into hardy peak and then over here like i said probably you know if not 180 degrees let's go 130 wrong the fact that there were those features the fact that it was a good trail you know it's sometimes when you go on a trail and then it like disappears into nothing it's like well this ain't the right way and you just back out and go so it it just now it's a good story but at the time it was we had never gotten more turned around than that we had never gotten more like well we're running out of time we got we were walking along and we all of a sudden lots of eyes and we're like oh please don't be a wolf pack it was instead of herd of deer but I guess they're deep enough in this wilderness preserve that they don't, they're not used to people. They don't care about people. Right. So we didn't get our way through them, but we walked within five yards of them with them, just the two bucks watching us and the rest of them contentedly munching on grass and stuff like that. So, and the re reflective eyes in the dark were like, this is a little spooky. Even I know these guys are just like little herbivore friendly things, you know? Right. So <laughs> to, 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 something actually you mentioned wolves and it's kind of funny because I'm going to be doing a talk on uh, wolves in fiction, myth versus reality. Uh, because I've got Hunter, I've been pushing the wolf with my writers and stuff and talking to the kids about it. I'm like, well, let's do a whole talk about it. Because a lot of our feelings and misconceptions about wolves is because of what's been in fiction, the big bad wolf and, you know, from there. But there's plenty of examples also of good wolves, but there's not a lot of wolf examples in fiction. I mean, not like, you know, stuff like that. But in general, in the reality of it, even if there were wolves, they probably would have left you alone. You're you're not something they're going to mess I'm with. There. In fact, this is long ago, probably junior high. I read a, so one of the things without even going into like the scary story nature of werewolves and 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 you know the kind of well, werewolves like, are different. You know, werewolves like, will <laughs> eat you. They'll bite your face off. Yeah, right. and because and, and, and they're people, so they have all the evils of right. people. Exactly. So after having thought, you know, knowing that wolves were often 
the reason that they got removed from various different national parks or near supposed civilization is because they were like, well, those wolves are stealing all my sheep. They're they're right. preying on my herds of things. And then I read a good book called Never Cry Wolf by, and to yes. this day, I remember, a guy named Farley Moat, you know, kind of a memorable name. And he did lots of studies of like living near the wolves. And they even made a movie out of this where it shows him like marking his territory with his urine. So the wolves would be, know he was there and it wouldn't. And by studying their scat, you know, there's wolf dudes everywhere. They're not eating big creatures. They're eating field mice. And so it's like, the, and, and then you see now on nature documentaries where they show wolves, foxes, coyotes, that they do that little hunting in the snow where they listen under the snow and then they jump up and go down and get them. And that's really what they do is they're, they actually keep the vermin levels down, not the, I'm going to go steal your cows and sheep and goats. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, so and, I've had a nice spot in my heart for wolves ever since of going, these guys, are, even though they're the apex predator, they're not menacing moose. They're not clearing they, out. They a, will. You know, they'll attack a moose right? if they need to, but they're, that's not their first choice because right. the, it is a dangerous hunt for them. But we, we have screwed up nature so badly so often on our understanding. Out in the Grand Canyon area, Yellowstone and all that, they killed off all the wolves because of that reason. Oh, and then they found out that all the rats and all that stuff like got huge. It's like, oh my gosh, what do we do? Well, let's bring wolves back in. Well, then they went the other way too bad and they had too many wolves and they killed off all of that and unbalanced things again. And then the wolves had nothing to eat. So yeah, now they are getting your sheep and stuff. So people, I, I'm, you know, as in general, we're stupid. We're really stupid, but we 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 hate admitting our mistakes. <laughs> and right. we, you know, the Isle Royal has a very similar story where they like brought in the predators and then and, and then got rid of them, and then they had too many of the prey, and just that, you know, then they're eating everything in sight because when you have too many deer, they really will eat things down to the ground, all that kind of stuff. I. I it's kind of funny. We tend to look for, quotes, silver bullet solutions, where it's like, what's the one big thing that we can do instead of, well, nature has reached its balance. You know what I mean? There really are. They, they actually do studies and they say the ratio is like 70 to 30 or whatever else it might be for how many prey animals you need for how many predators. And it all works out. And what, what do the predators kill off? Not the pride of the herd, they kill off the weak and the slow and the, the worst of the young and stuff like that. So all those things they talk about for survival of the fittest, it really happens in nature if you let it. You know what I mean? They don't want to work hard. They'd rather bring down the lame wildebeest <laughs> than, right. than the, you know, the, the, the toughest of the Cape Buffalo who are going to like gore them and put their life at risk and stuff. So right. but Colleen and I, we, we just discovered a good series on the national parks. We really love watching nature documentaries because they're, they're, the good ones are much about, here's what we know. It's not anthropomorphizing them to where they give them human characteristics. And this one's brave. And this one's, you know, they never say the cowardly anything. It's, they just, this last, last one was about the Badlands and how there's prairie dog towns and, the, you know, the balance between the buffaloes dropping their droppings everywhere are kind of like the elephants in Africa. They enable all kinds of stuff because that's such a good fertilizer and it carries seeds in it. So they get carried further than the wind or um, natural mm -hmm. other natural forces would take them. And then the prairie dogs use it to like uh, build their dens and they actually like the smell of the dung is enough so that it guards them because it's an overpowering smell and other predators can't smell past the poop that they're using as a as, as a uh, right. subterfuge you know what i mean and they talk and, and all the way up and down dung beetles and here's the owls the burrow owl it just was they were really good about showing there isn't a hero animal there isn't a villain animal you know what i mean right. like the lion king might have you believe that all these things matter and that even you know, like the snake the, the swifts build their beautiful nests up on a cliff face a big rain comes and takes it all down. So what do they do? Go build underneath a, an, an overpass. And sometimes man builds things that animals take advantage of. You know, when we started to lose eagles and falcons and stuff like that, they started to nest on the sides of buildings in our cities. And how cool that whatever the, whatever they do to, to still be able to find things to hunt, hopefully not little Fifi the poodle, but cities are loaded with rats and, and uh, yeah. gophers, vermin, whatever else might yeah. be around. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but at the RG a couple weeks ago, we had the zoo come in and somebody was talking about a project they did up there in Cleveland that they had a problem with uh, seagulls 
in the the city and the rats and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. what do they do to get rid of it? Well, they got some mating uh, falcons and put them on different buildings. The companies, the building c- companies, these they had sponsors to help pay for putting these nests in and everything they needed for that. And right. now it's grown. It's you know tripled, quadrupled, something like that. But just as simple as putting in some birds, a little bit of money, instead of a big trying to kill off all the rats and stuff and the birds take care of it and people understand that and are more proud now and i love those type of Mm -hmm. stories because it makes sense and it's a great solution rather than everybody's initial solution well what chemicals can we throw down that'll kill everything you know right you know what It's, it's kind of funny the what came to mind just now was we often do that that we overreact or that we We don't get that there's a balance or things like that. There's a Sesame Street sketch from way back where Bert and Ernie are sitting around and there's like a drip from the faucet. And Bert goes to Ernie, hey, could you take care of that? And instead of going and turning off the faucet, he goes and like turns on the radio to drown it out. And it's like, well, well, now that you know that music a little bit too loud, could you take care of that? And instead of turning off the radio he goes and turns on a blender and there's this escalating series of things and it really captures like the episode is loud and that finally, you know, finally like bird is yelling you know oh, hey, stop it and when he turns those things off kind of backwards in succession it's kind of like what we've had to do when we reintroduce animals they they had, they had a great scene in this this national parks one where they talked about for the badlands that you know way back when buffalo bill and all the buffalo hunters they, there were millions in herds of bison and, and that they had pretty much killed them off, made them extinct. And that they introduced back in 63, you know, so going on 60 years now, like four, four bison into the Badlands. And so that while they're talking about this, they're coming over a rise and they come over the rise and now there's a wonderful prairie full of bison. And it's not millions, it's thousands, maybe 10,000 or something like that. But it was still, if, if you let them alone, if you understand well enough, what nature does to find balance and a lot of i don't know i like where we learn things because we don't don't, you don't have to do an autopsy on an animal to understand how it works they tag them they track them they find out what the the range of their range is and stuff like that and when they when they come to here's some birds like where do we see let's see not the owls maybe it's the the cliff swallows they don't come from like the next state down. They come from Mexico. There's another kind of bird that comes all the way from South America. And if we don't have that habitat for them, the right combination of water and trees to roost in or cliffs to roost in and stuff like that, we, we've had, they've had die-offs in a year where we've done habitat destruction. And, and like, like after you've seen those guys return every year for a hundred years, don't you get the clue that maybe if you, you really could put a big kink in in the hose of them ever coming back if you destroy you fill in the swamp where they usually nest or something like that and yet they have cautionary tales about that you know we killed off all the passenger pigeons we put in and and sometimes invasive species like right now right down in the everglades they have problems with snakes that people got as pets and then like let them out in the swamp hey you'll have a happy life here well not if they then eat all the eggs of all the other things that live in the swamp and get to be 20 feet long instead of three and all that kind of stuff. Oh, well, it, it, it you, you, you <laughs> use the word progress, but mm-hmm. in this context, the definition of progress is some big guy in a corporation that wants to make money. So we need to fill in this swamp to build this shopping mall because that's progress. No, it, it's money for you. <laughs> we have, that's right. I, I don't understand why we have to keep building new this, that, and the other thing when we have abandoned this and open space that was a building here. I, I don't get why that, I, maybe that's why I'm not a multi-million dollar uh, real estate mogul. Right, because your progress is not linear and it's what I want. Right. It's, the example that we just both named, I know that maybe like 30 years ago now, they did a big study of, you know, we've got a certain amount of environmental pollution and we can put scrubbers on our coal plants. We can, all the different kinds of things that were big solutions. But what they also discovered was, you know, it really works well, wetlands, that they take environmental pollution out of it and kind of lock it into and and bring it into the ground and that you don't have polluted waters and dangerous to swim in stuff and everything like that and we have been consistently oh i don't like those cattails they they uh, look funny they smell it smells like a swamp around here now they've got 
all of the good rules that say if you're going to build a project like that, you have to recreate wetlands and swales so that 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 process, that natural process still happens. And not only for pollution, but also for like water ebb and flow. You know, I think we talked about this well, I mean, like 100 episodes ago, that the more that you pave places, the water doesn't soak into any asphalt or concrete. So you have to kind of like direct where all that goes, or you have to, we've had wonderful examples right here in Lakewood. We, uh, right across the street from us, they tore down um, a, a church and school and put in a CVS, but they didn't just pave it all over they removed all the things about the church and the school so that as many things as possible the beautiful stained glass there was a lot of reuse of materials asphalt is the most recycled thing on the planet that i that's kind of i read that and i was like that makes sense not plastic not all the things you put in your bins down by the street but every time they tear up a road they don't take that asphalt and dump it in the ocean they kind of like regrind it remelt it and it becomes the, the for, perfectly fine usable asphalt yeah. for the next set of roads so they not only put in the, the stuff for the parking lot but they put in swales you know water water collection and plants growing around these things and so it's actually very pretty it doesn't smell like a swamp it's got the right mix of pollution removing and pollinating and all that kind of stuff they know enough about it now that like and and it's kind of funny we have a mcdonald's nearby that they they did it so that their their biggest business nowadays is their drive-through more even than their sit down and have dinner at a mcdonald's but instead of it just being all like concrete they made it so that it's a nice winding concrete thing that takes you through the drive-through and all around it are beautiful plants and cattails and useful stuff. So whatever their lot size was, they dedicated like 30% to the restaurant and 70% to, if not beautifying, at least not wrecking the environment around it where you're going to have runoff and you're going to have, uh, I don't know, I, they, 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 I think like liquid is a really good place for, they've got things in, in place that say you can't do this kind of change without being aware of the environmental impact right. you have to file those statements and this is another one of those things that i see poo pooed by various truly ignorant people that they make fun of environmental impact statements i don't care about the snail darter well what you should care about is species loss matters but even more your clean air and your clean water and your the flow of things and the way that you if you put in a road and cut off what used to be a migration path for creatures, you might as well just kill them. And so I, I, I've seen wonderful things. I think we talked about this a while back. In Canada was the first place that I saw, but now I see them many places in the United States. They have a super highway, a three lane right. on each side the... where there's no way animals can make it over without running into the barrier in the middle. And so you see death, death, death. Then instead, they built that overpass and not just concrete but they made it part of the forest Grass. it's got dirt on it and all the right things so that these animals feel secure and now they don't have just record road deaths it's, for people trying to beat 60 it, mile an hour cars and i know american it's thinking it, it's like <laughs> well i don't want my taxes to spend for that that's stupid oh, smash geez. your car into it you now owe how much money to fix your car well gee it would have been cheaper to pay the taxes than to, to pay, fix my car now it, it, you know we're so reactive in the wrong way most of the time i've said that you know right. our, our reaction is always the exact opposite in 180 degree extreme Dream, yeah. you know yeah and and it's kind of i know this is a terrible thing to say so much of how we treat the natural natural world seems to be is it cuddly or is it icky you know <laughs> what i mean it, yes. not everything has to be a kitten in order for it to be a beautiful creature and useful to the environment Possums. And, you know what i mean Possums Possums are example, awesome. they look a little spooky with the big eyes and but they're they are they eat all the mosquitoes they you ticks. know what i mean they they, they, they ticks they and even like all the insects, they used to remember, I, I grew up where we used to have the trucks come by spraying mosquito stuff everywhere, which I'm pretty sure was not good for the kids as well. But at the time, we didn't know enough about Agent Orange and DDT and whatever else. It's gotten safer, I think, over the years. But now they've, they've actually done so much better about you don't need to, all, again, the laws of unintended consequences, when you find out that, hey, that pollution, no that insecticide that you were using pesticide to make sure your crops were good well man it killed off everything it really was like agent orange where besides your wheat it defoliated everything else roundup is one of those terrible things there's ongoing court cases and scientific proof that says it's not always evil 
but absolutely by dose, it can be devastatingly bad. And people just, they, they don't read the label. They get out there with a spritz can and they're going, I'm going to click. Oh my God. Like, and, and then they wonder why all their roses died. All the butterflies that used to come to those roses died. Or, or worse, that's one of my pet peeves is these oh. people with their, these postage stamp lawns, you know, I, I, I have a lot of lawn, so I'm a little right. biased, yeah. um, but these postage stamp lawns and, and they have a little bit growing up around their cement driveway. So they have to get the roundup and spray it to kill off those weeds. It's like, folks, it's going into the freaking water supply. You drink that then. Oh, but right. we've got filters in this, but it's overwhelming. We can't get it all out. <laughs> and we take so much medicine when we pee, we're adding so many <laughs> drugs to our water and, and you know, people don't get how bad that is and it's like you know a little vinegar with some dish soap and baking uh soda or something you, you put you spray that on the plants if you have a little bit of the plants it kills it just as well exactly, or heck yeah. pull it up or you know sometimes. we got some great weeding tools i mean it's kind of funny i'm really bad about getting down on my knees nowadays i'm not the right weight proportion so that my knees immediately hurt it's even a long way down for you those guys down and stuff like that whereas colleen got out there and by having the right tools where you really can get all the way down like you know a dandelion if you pull the top of it it's still down there it'll yeah. come back but we really did with hot water and with pulling things out have our our sidewalks really nice without having had to get in there with the the devastating crap i consume reports i really love this magazine always have it's really good about you know how to how to shop how to buy and it also has all kinds of they do studies about you got to worry about mercury and here's the kinds of tuna that really check for and make sure that they keep those levels down or not or not only that, but other PCBs and, and let's see, phthalates and stuff like that. They're in the environment. And they're not they're not that way about overreacting and saying, oh my God, the world's going to end because we got to get rid of all the phthalates. But they really talk about the difference between three parts per million per billion and five is like, like kids eating lead paint or not. It really can damage. It affects reproductive cycles. Kids mature too quickly. Whatever all the various different things are, it... They're really good about, therefore, avoid some of these products. If it really is that everybody stop buying these certain insecticides or these certain sunscreens or whatever else it might be, and we kept them out of our environment, uh, the term that they often use is there are forever chemicals. Yeah. They don't break down in the environment for like 10,000 years. The sun doesn't do enough. The, the mighty wetlands plants don't do enough. Once you've got microplastics in your environment, you're going to be finding them in the fish and the fish that you eat, and, and suddenly you're finding out that people have these things circulating, because they really are micro, you know, you're not aware of, you don't like, that tastes gritty, I must have eaten some microplastic, they're terribly small, but they still affect us in terms of they build up in your system, and then what they were made of, start leeches into your system, or if they get into a duct, you know, our our digestive system is really mighty. The acids in our stomach are really acidic and stuff like that, but not for everything. And then you find out that that's why kids are having problems with perhaps, and, and let me think how to say this. I think that science is great about not saying it's yes or no, right or wrong, but it's about percentages. If there's a way that you can say the odds are that by having this environment, that they're going to have learning disabilities or they're going to have physical abnormalities right. or something like that. It isn't, you have to be sure, but man, wouldn't you roll the dice to make sure that your children are safe? Wouldn't you take those things out of the environment? If it's like, well, it's only 60, 40, but the cost of it being 60% true is that your, your kid doesn't have fingers. What, what in the world are you doing to allay your fears that you're willing to take that huge risk? And unfortunately, it's not only consumer reports out there. There's all kinds of woo-woo craziness that talk about which things, you know what I mean? They really go from zero to 60 in terms, oh my God, this is dangerous, got to get rid of it. Or they talk about, oh, avoid it. We've had it in our environment for years and it hasn't harmed anybody. It's never at one of the end or the other of the spectrum. We kind of have to make the smart scientific choice. And yet that's not where the advertising dollars go. That's not where people, like you said, Mr. Corporate says, my brownfield cleanup would cost too much money. Keep on going. And when we finally are liable in a court, I guess I'm shutting down my asbestos and mercury plant. Yeah. Because 
I, I've already wrung all the dollars out of it. I'm not going to clean up after myself. And that's maddening. That level of crazy is what led to all of our global warming and climate change that we've known for a long time. The extrapolation of pretty good scientific facts is going to lead us to too much, too many degrees. And we're going to be melting the ice caps and raising the water levels and causing hyper hurricanes and that kind of stuff. And yet somebody needed a third yacht. Somebody needed yeah. to win the game. And it'll be a breakthrough for all of society when we not only have, hey, we stopped it and we're now fixing it, but where are we getting the money from that? By clawing back the impossible profits that were made that led to this in the first place. You know what I mean? That the the big oil companies, the big coil plants, the big multinationals that have used the fact that they're so big to evade reasonable choices, evade the law, man, it'll be a, a big thing for when we finally get to, no, you got to pay for the cleanup. Or, then, yeah. or people will suddenly realize, well, we're, we're in trouble and there's absolutely nothing we can do and the human race is going to die off in less than 100 years. And just as we've said before, folks, we're not trying to save the planet. The planet's going to be fine. And it's going to be fine. Exactly. <laughs> it us. might be Chernobylized, but it's going to do just fine with three eyed deer. Just we yeah. won't be around. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so. before, you know, before you think, hey, well, that's not natural. It's a, you know what? The animals and plants we have right now is not the first generation of animal and plants that have been on the planet either. There, there have been several said. varieties of each throughout the years. So, yes, it'll change. Yes, it'll be different. But again, we won't really know because we'll be gone. One of the reasons that everybody should be watching all those dystopic futures, all the black mirrors, all the soiling greens is because they're not that far afield. A lot of times they're just what we have plus 10% worse. They're not a crazy story made up out of whole cloth. All of a sudden it really is. What do we do when everything is polluted and we're fighting for the last clean water left on the planet? What, who's going to go to war between India and China with a huge shared border and a billion people? can't supply them all with the water that they need what in the world is going to happen there so that it, it, science fiction as you and i have talked about it isn't fiction it's like it's talking about now under the guise of well that's just an alien that's just a you know <laughs> science fiction is kind of just a future science fact <laughs> there you go exactly okay. and then, <laughs> so. so so i was gonna say so we talked about al's folly getting lost in the woods Let's talk about Al's folly with the internet scams. What what is going on with that? So, you know, I kind of think, having said, hey, consumer reports and everything else, I try to be a reasonable consumer. And you just, if you're, I've been on the internet like forever. And previous to that, BBSs and the CompuServes and AOLs and whatever. So I try to be a canny internet person. And yet there was recently an ad on Facebook that was, hey, we lost our license to sell white mountain jigsaw puzzles and you should come to our site because we're clearing our inventory. And I went there and it wasn't, I don't know, you've been to scammy sites where they, they look like someone just threw something together and they're trying to get your money out. Instead, it was full bore, had all the right menu of options. They had the, the, ex, the catalog of what they had from white mountain was extensive. It was like 16 different pages of all different kinds of stuff. So I went through and, and they really were like $3.99 and $4.99 instead of the $15, $30 that they often are. And so I picked a whole bunch and the cart application worked just right with, oh, you're in the United States dollars. It'll be this much postage and handling. You've spent more than $75. So we'll make that for free. And in fact, we'll even throw in a little puzzle solving thing. You know, one of those things where you can do the puzzle out and move it off when you have to use your table. Mm. All of it looked just fine. And so I spent 77 bucks. But then, and I even got a confirming email. It was simulating that whole experience that I've done many times before for let's buy some books or some puzzles or some clothes or whatever else it might be. And it, it wasn't, you know, oh no, uh, not eBay, which has some protections, not Amazon. It was its own independent thing. And there's even a little bit of, I want to think that Facebook does some clearing of things and that things will disappear if enough people complain about things. And so it, none of that had happened yet. So I went ahead and did it. Then I started to see, wow, there's a lot of these kinds of ads on Facebook, and they all seem to have a different thing that they're targeting. If it's not jigsaw puzzles, it's gym shoes, or it's, you know what I mean, something that has a recognizable brand. There was even another for Ravenburger, Ravenburger puzzles instead of yeah, white. Yeah. And 
so I, I actually sent after I got the email from them and then didn't hear from them for like four, five, six days. And they said, hey, well, FedEx, it, you'll have it by then. It's like, so haven't heard from you guys. Don't even have like a being processed number. Don't have a tracking number for my shipment. Please let me know. Someone wrote back and said, yes, here's the tracking number. And it's going to be coming. You know, they didn't give me a due date, but they gave me a tracking number. So I signed on to that tracking thing. And that's when I found out oh, coming out of China. OK, maybe it's because it's they they a lot of things get bought and sold manufactured in china initially that i my impression from white mountain being in vermont was it was a local store in the northeast that was having right. this problem then i look at the, my order on the thing and i see wow they have a whole bunch of choices for different currency that's not a very united states centric thing which is its own jingoistic thing i don't like that but their default one was in low lew -E that is a romanian currency and so I'm like, you know, all those little things, hackles are going up as to, oh, I don't know that I like this now. But still, I got a reply back to my thing saying, here's your tracking number. It's going to be coming. I started to track it. I translated the little Chinese that's saying, okay, it's working its way through China. Now it's at like a Hong Kong port coming to the United States. So it's not going to be four to six days. But it, And all of it was looking good enough that I didn't immediately say, cancel my order, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So... Let's see, do I have my prop? With <laughs> Show and tell time. <laughs> uh, exactly. So this is what I got. Wow. A Susie Chow scarf. Nice. That's beautiful. You know what, you know what this isn't? 16 it's not uh, puzzles, puzzles and, and games. Jigsaw puzzle table. <laughs> and so I just, Colleen, in talking about, hey, I'm suspicious, but I'm going to let it go and see what happens. She had actually said that she had read that they do things like this, where they do send you something, but it's like a packet of seeds. It's like a nothing thing. And so I don't want the scarf. I don't want a $77 scarf. I want the jigsaw puzzles or not. And so I have filed a dispute with my bank. You know, luckily the banks will go to bat for you. They'll still get my money back if at all they can. I didn't write further to them thinking, well, now this is obvious fraud. They just strung me along all this time. It stinks. And and I guess, and I wrote a little Facebook, little big Facebook post about it, that what weirds me out about this is I hate things that aren't only sneaky and they got my money, but they actually eat away at the, the trust, the yeah. confidence that you have that the world is an okay place. It wasn't just here's five puzzles and like the minimum amount they did serious work to recreate. They stole somebody else's site and funneled it so that they'll get the money instead, but they were never going to ship me any jigsaw puzzles. They did all the language translation and currency translation. It sur like will survive the first 10 suspicions that you might have as to, nope, they really do have not just an internet address, but a physical address. They, as I investigated, Everything about the site looked fine and I was okay. Only when I was then, maybe this is a scam. And nowadays you can go using the internet to go is, and, and the place was called, let's see. I want to say Wayzata, but it's not that. Starzata, I really should know. In fact, uh, it'll come to me. But I did like, you know, is this a scam? Is this trustworthy? And then you see all the various different sites that track that kind of stuff. And then I found out that this place in particular had a, rating of like two out of 10. One of the things that's happening now, Timu is a big site. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll say with all the caveats, you know, a lot of this is happening in China. And it's not that China is an entire, like, uh, uh, wretched hive of scum and villainy. <laughs> but there's things that make it so that they can get away with things because it really is there's always delays coming from overseas or their laws are not as firm as ours are in terms of prosecuting right. scams and stuff like this. And I hate that there are entire seemingly huge million billion dollar things that are then revealed to be scams and that they think that that's a way of doing business that they kind of laugh at the if I was clever enough to fool you I get your money and in, in, in let's say 25 years ago when a lot of internet commerce started there was a lot of people that were like I'm not going to let them put cookies on my machines. I'm not going to give them my credit card information. I'm going to have a specific credit card that's like a one-time use that I get from my bank so that I can't get ripped off. And all that has been allayed over the course of the last 20, 25 years because Amazon did right. eBay did right. The big e-commerce places prove that they have 
not only that they deliver the product, but that they have reputation systems that weed out the bad guys that were, there's always rats in the system. There's always people gnawing away at the, the tree of goodwill, and yet they found a way to filter them out. Facebook isn't doing that yet, and the world isn't doing a good job about that. And so every everything nowadays, when I like, you go on Amazon and you buy, I, I buy computers things. I need a, a specific USB-C to, you know, Macintosh video cable. Where's my adapter? And you hope that it's not just going to be like, it doesn't work. That it's, that it looks like a cable, but it's made out of the cheapest products available. And they don't have all the pins connected to all the wires. And that, and then what do you do for, they got five bucks for me. Well, multiply that by a million suckers and they've made good money on a fake product. And that seems to be happening more and more. And I am, I'll, I'll jump to this. Long ago, there was a scam where in, in London, hmm, if you know a little bit about finance, you know that there's an overall global debt rate that is set by looking at things from various different exchanges and countries. And they do an average and a cumulative look at that. And they set what's called the LIBOR rate. And that's what every other place uses to set their appropriate rates in their countries, in their companies, in their exchanges, all that kind of stuff. Found out that two rogue guys were actually manipulating that rate and letting certain people know with enough time that it's going to be going up or down. And as you know, it, it moves by you know 0.01. But if you do that for a million dollars, every time you do that, you can make yourself ten thousand, a hundred thousand dollars, and all around the globe. And so that kind of thing of like they couldn't have picked a worse tree to gnaw at the roots of than the root debt number that everyone else is uses to set their stuff. Yeah. So that. It, it seems to be that it kind of just, well, that's just the price of doing business and don't worry, we'll deal with it. And we'll make sure that those guys are gone and we'll put in better people. But every time that you read about people wanting to dismantle our protections that we have in place, our monitoring that we have in place for how we're making sure that our food and our water and our air and our, everything is the way it, it should be and the way it should be safely, like that's some of the best money we spend I want we as a cooperative society to make sure that when I buy meat, it isn't loaded with salmonella right. or that I have to say, well, I can only trust one brand because all these other five could be scammy and the price of scammy could be death. I, I just don't get the short sightedness of that. And I don't, I hate the fact that there are people that actively work on, man, if I bag that big fish, I'm going to make this much money. But in the act of getting it, I, I screw the system. I screwed up for literally everyone. But it doesn't matter because I got my money. It doesn't matter because yeah. I got mine. I got my swimming pool. I got my I got my fucking silk suit or whatever else it might be. And it's kind of weird. You know, Wired Magazine has had really great coverage and, and maybe Rolling Stone as well of lots of these various different scams. And, you know, human beings are human beings. They do something to fuck the world. And you find out what did they get out of that? A bigger house, a faster car, more pussy. It it's just disgusting that people are willing to do such damage because what they wanted caviar because yeah. they just wanted to be the big man on uh, you and, know, and I wanted I want to buy every Earth Jordan that I want gym shoes you screwed the world for gym shoes our, our culture oh my God. our culture is a lot to blame for that and, and you know other cultures too but because people look at and put value in such a strong desire on the people that, especially now with all the videos, oh, look, they're driving a Maserati and that's a better car than mine. I need to have a Maserati because it's showy. It's fine. I get Indeed. respect. I get, <laughs> you know, the, you know, like the mobsters, you know, those guys got respect. These guys now drive these Maseratis and wearing the suits and having the, the, they, it's the respect, the fame, the fortune and that, you know, yeah, but who does that appeal to? The worst of society, not the best. Absolutely. You, you really think you're going to be a better person because you got a fast car? What the fuck is wrong with you? You know what I mean? But, I just... <laughs> but, but our culture is really wired that way a bit. You know, if somebody drives up in a 
a super not necessarily a sports car not you know one of the gangster cars or something but something that's a respectable businessman and he gets out and he's wearing a suit armani suit and with nice shoes and tie right and, and everybody he, treats him better he gets the girl he gets the better table at the restaurant exactly right and, and right. people say oh yes sir and they automatically you know are nice to him in the restaurant and worse. Well, since you're big, rich and famous, we'll give it to you for free. You're the one that can afford it. And <laughs> you don't have to pay for the it. Least. Exactly. Yeah, you know, but then you get somebody <laughs> like Keanu Reeves who literally Great will example. hand people food and money and talk, sit down and talk to people that are homeless. He walks down the street and people ignore him because he's not dressed big and flashy. And, you know, our culture is helping push that and helping keep that type of thing alive i've always wanted to be able to say this probably won't happen ever but ha have like i have enough money i could go buy the bmw i want or you know the lincoln or whatever and right. go to the showroom wearing like ripped up sweatpants and a, a dirty t-shirt right. because see how you get treated yeah right. it's the julia roberts thing you know the one salesman who gives me respect and talks to me is just about to make a really big sale you that's know right. that's right you know so uh colleen and i are retired and we're comfortable and one of the things we colleen read a book a long time ago i think called the tree grows in brooklyn that talks about tipping is such a privilege that instead of it being, you know, there, there's a lot of weirdness about tipping where people use it to take revenge on a bad server. They didn't get here in that within two seconds of when I ordered. Oh yeah. That's a whole discussion on our attitudes towards yeah. waiters and stuff. That, yeah. that we like that little bit of who I've got under my thumb. Colleen and I regularly tip big because it just seems like, you know, I, I want my little drinky refills. Colleen wants her food prepared in a certain way. If they come through for us and are attentive to us and are pleasant, they don't get, you know, nowadays it's 18%. I'm not trying to be a jerk. They get like 30, 40, 50, 60, yeah. 100. We're not quite the thousand dollar tip like a big basketball player can be. And yet it's a privilege of us to be able to have a meal out in the first place and to have that nice rapport with our server. And, and it's kind of weird when we have people that really aren't good to us, we don't stiff them, but like, man, you, you had such an opportunity here. We're really like pretty, pretty good to people when you take care of us and you weren't. And so we don't. And so it's in that little way of, I guess, society has stratified things. You know what I mean? Where if you're, if you're waitstaff, you're, you're just one step away from indentured servitude. People love ordering them around. They love acting in period yeah. when and you go to a restaurant. <laughs> And we don't do that. And we make fun of the people that are like, really, you're oh, going to send God, your food back. Yes. And, and, you know, you talked the other day about the, the prime rib that was fixed. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if you send your food back, do you really think you're going to get your food back well? Or is somebody going to have it like, boy, I think I threw it on the floor first and then I grilled it up for yeah. you. I, who knows if that really happens? But I, there's, there's famous quotes from many people. I'm not even sure who said it first, but when you see how someone treats waiters, that's how they're going to treat anybody who they think they have the upper hand on, including you. Yeah. So when you're on a date, it's such an important thing to not have the guy that snoots around with trying the wine. And no, that's not a Chateau Lab. You know what I mean? It's not yeah. the one I want. I just, I'm so relatively easygoing until they, until they do wrong by me. Then I really do. Like, I hate when they spoil the nice night out. And, and I guess there's so many ways in which society, I wish I understood, like, I don't know we see bad drivers all the time. And it's like, is it that they feel so powerless in every other facet of their life that out on the road, that's where they're going to be the jerk that everybody's been to them. They're going to cut you off. They're going to tailgate you. They're going to just make, they're going to make a ton of bad decisions with impunity because the cops aren't everywhere. And like, wow, I, I wish society wasn't creating that. What are you going to do about it? store up that tension so that yeah. then they let it all out in a in a more dangerous way than if they just said right. no i can't work this weekend boss no right. i really already have plans that and and the anonymity factor of being in your car and thinking that you know nobody can tell who you are it's kind of like being online i'm jumping all over but in my mind it really is all related right <laughs> that anonymity that says you know people say things online that they would never say to somebody else's face because yeah. it's so impolite because they could get bashed in the face if they said something as rude, vulgar, 
pushy as what they're doing now. And and I just I try not they to feel I, my I, I, persona be me. It's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the same thing we said. They, they, they feel they've got some power. I, look at me. Uh, look at uh, everyone. Listen to me because I'm cutting this other person down. And that's what I need to make myself feel important. And it's the stereotype. It's the greasy, overweight, smelly guy that's uh, sitting in his parents' basement doing this. You know, it's a stereotype. Right. But unfortunately, it, it starts to look true and talking about the waiters and waitresses oh it is such a pet peeve i have never gone out to eat where it's so life and death that i have to have my food five minutes earlier than when i got it you know uh, sometime if i really need to make it to that show and the food's sure. running late well that might partly be my fault take some responsibility it is very easy to tell when the restaurant is packed there's a line at the door and there's only one or two waiters running around taking care of everybody exactly and people get well we've been here for 30 seconds and nobody offered us water and we don't have our menus yet you know what because oh, you're, you're you're proving the trailer park trash right there you're not at a hundred dollar a plate restaurant you're at a 15 dollar a plate restaurant and you want to make that <laughs> poor kid's life miserable because That's you're right. so important that and then <laughs> then they're also the same people that will like take i heard stories like the this a, a, a very stereotype trailer park trash family like the baby literally is pulling poop out of its diaper and smearing oh. it on the table and oh. they put a napkin over it and left oh. it and expected the server to clean it and asked for more food and well i've been done with oh. my plate for about uh, three minutes and you didn't stop to see if i needed more okay you weigh about 450 pounds you probably don't need it sorry to say folks and they think they have the right to give the waiters a hard time about it it's just, you know, you can really, you you always talk about, you can tell somebody when you play a game with them, what they're like. And this is another indication. If you're one of those people that goes to a cheap game ass restaurant, a restaurant right. yeah, and I, you know, I'm one of them. I will go to cheap ass restaurants. I, if, if I'm at his place and it says 75 bucks a plate, I'm like, wow, we're not doing this for another decade, you know, right. but I, I'd never treat the waiters like that. And it's always polite. And I'll see them and like, and I'll even say, yeah, could we have some more water? Oh yeah, I'm busy. Hold on. No problem. Take your time. I'm not right. dying of thirst. You know, you, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I sometimes when I'm going to be in another city and I have no idea as to the quality of restaurants, I'll use like the Yelps and the trip advisors and stuff like that to look up reviews. And once in a while, you'll even see the person leave a review that was like, you must've been a horrible customer. Yes. You doesn't focus on, the quality of the food or the quality of the service it's it's like i didn't get this I, yeah i didn't get this that is like well that's not even a reasonable thing to so it, they they can't help themselves in some ways uh colleen and i we like going mostly to the places like you said <laughs> i think i told this before am i going to like a hundred dollar person place i'm always thinking man that's like five pizzas you know that's like you know 30 yes. big packs i just i can't i can't enjoy food that much i don't have a defined enough refined enough palate or i don't think that that experience of like i'm a casual guy dressing up and like it doesn't make me feel any better about myself this is kind of weird most of the people that go to those restaurants are not my people right not exactly the puts the snoot on in order to get that better treatment and think that i really enjoy maybe that's something we like going to our buffets because it is a great You'll see everybody there from all different social strata. And I think that the parents manage their kids pretty well because they're teaching them how to go to the buffet and make choices as opposed to once you run around the restaurant while I look at my phone and kind of eat. And so I, I, we tend to go to restaurants, not only that have good food that we like, but places that the atmosphere matches kind of yeah. the experience that we want. And yeah. it isn't at the, the terrible low end, it isn't at the terrible high end. We're like good like regular people <laughs> you know, yeah. I like to say like regular normal middle class i even though we could do more or less it isn't we don't act like that i don't go to a restaurant to i don't know to have that kind of competition right. not, you know what i mean i don't need that experience of pounding on the table or anything like that <laughs> so i wish it wasn't as as much when when we see that happen we almost like you, you'd be, I guess, proud, but maybe chagrined as to how often we will say something like, you know, just sotto voce, just loud enough so someone could overhear 
but like you just can't help it what a jerk and then have other people in the restaurant you hear them go yeah you know what i mean or start it clapping be that, that goes unsaid it's not only for the restaurant to handle you, you spoiled my night by being such an ass you raised your voice in a restaurant not over over nothing over nothing and like wow i just agreed, <laughs> agreed. they're they're, oh, well. they're, they're, they're... I, I'll give this younger generation a bit of credit in this regard. You know, as they 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 call us boomers, I'm not a boomer. <laughs> I'm Gen X, which is after boomers. Right. But I understand their sentiment that oh, you boomers don't get it. You're you're right. We it is difficult to understand some way that's 30 years younger. It's a totally different thinking. But I will give this millennial generation some credit. In general, they're not putting up with that crap. They don't let other people be idiots and bullies and a-holes and everything else they right. will say something they will speak up they will have each other's back now on right. the flip side they're also the same ones that say oh my god i'm working at starbucks and i've been here for eight hours and they expect me to work all weekend and i've been at school all week and now there's seven people in line and how am i supposed to handle this okay it's the same group but you know <laughs> so i think i mentioned i really have been enjoying the sandman slim books by yes. Cat. And I'm, I'm on the second to last. I'm on the penultimate book. And he did a very interesting thing where Sam Slim is uh, dating a younger woman. Not so much younger that it's weird, but still of, of the next generation so that she has characteristics that we would use almost stereotypically. And one of the things is the pronouns thing as to it's not he, she, they're, they're non-binary. So it's they and they And he makes the attempt because he's a good guy at least when he's not killing monsters, etc., to be, why wouldn't you do it? Why not do it? Somebody asks to be called. And I wonder whether the author did this as an interesting experiment, because then, of course, his dialogue and the way it's used in the book is they, them, and it's really distracting. Instead of, like, already, let me think how to say this. If you ever read War and Peace or anything with a large cast of characters, especially where they have multiple names, it's their formal name and their informal name and, and whatever else it might be, it's really distracting to continually have to go to the glossary and say, so who was the Count de Farge again? And, and you know, that oh, oh, that's Leonardo. Every time that they say they and them, I'm looking for, well, what group was that right. part of? Or that if they say they to them, are they talking to her or the but because they're often doing group things together and she only responds doesn't the whole group say well should i respond as well he did say they and so i'm not sure if he did it to like say good i'm with the program i agree that everybody should get called what they want to but that also seeing it in print lets you know that it's not a full solution because it can be imprecise and distracting and when you have a good word and you decide to stop using it for something that is this way more of a bigger net that you lose something, you lose that precision, you lose that right. um, correspondence, I guess, between the person and and how you can refer to them in a way that makes it obvious. Right. So I, 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 that thing of protesting about that people don't get that by, uh, gender is fluid and that people really do have multiple pieces to themselves, multiple phases of themselves that, and it changes over the course of time. And it's always up to them to decide what they want, but maybe the things that we fight about languages, that's not a good one to me. That's not, and, and like actually get where they get, they tell you, and then, oh no, you slipped up and still said she, because she's a she <laughs> that they get angry about it. It's like, right. Well, you're going to have to have a little patience as well as your righteousness because yes oh my a, god you know I mean? I've, I've got been years worth of i speak really precisely i often try to think of exactly the right word for a situation for a person for for an everything and you asking me to fuzz that is asking a lot i get that it really matters to you but i hope that you get how much it matters to me that i yes. am well spoken. and that's that, another that, thing with this I generation mean? they have no <laughs> tolerance for anyone. It's like, okay, I have known you for 25 years. I have said, he is doing this. He went there, blah, blah. For 25 years, I have known this. I have called you that. And then yeah. you sat up one day and said, no, now I'm a she. So you need to refer to me as she. Three <laughs> seconds later, I say, well, yeah, I was just talking to him. No, it's her, not him. Oh my <laughs> God. I can't like, I, I can't recreate this brain pathways that have this connection give me a right. bit and i do 
the, the they and them grammar wise have always been able to be used in place of it's a lesser known and not as common we used thing is why we're not used to it but if i was like oh yeah i was on with alan today we were talking about the woods they were telling me a story i'm still referring to alan and it's still grammatically accurate right. Though, Contextually, it's that you don't lose yeah. track of. Yes, it still refers to Alan exactly. But yeah. it is more difficult, and that's why I kind of named exactly the examples that I gave of. If you're like, "Hey, there's a posse of people that are going to go and fight the ghosts," and every time you say "they," does everybody in the group go, "What?" You know what I mean? They they like it's right. it's it's imprecise. And, and I guess, of course, what you can always say is their name. But another thing you do when you write is. You don't just keep saying the same word again. I got an automatic thesaurus in my head that says someone doesn't just walk there. They ambled and they sauntered and they, you know what I mean? They, right. There's all kinds of things that I do to use better adjectives and to add spice to what I'm writing. And to find out that I'm being told that there's only one way to say something like that is just, it's difficult for me. And I think that it's not as good as what we had had in some ways, even though I understand the societal forces that are pushing us towards that. I understand that too. And so I'm trying to find my accommodation, my understanding as to why it's going to be worth making the transition kind of all the time, but not just say, you know, we're, it's not that this is perfect. We're giving something up and doing it. I, I have you know a, I mean? a, so. an issue personally <laughs> that suddenly this one new generation of people that 40 or 50 percent of them were born wrong and they're not really a boy they're a girl and they're not really a girl they're a boy that 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 there's that large of a majority of them that oh nope you must have you know but worse for me is that as a kid 12 saying no 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 i'm not a boy i'm really a girl but the people that will immediately jump on that and say, well, then you better give them hormones and you better uh, give them surgery right now. And what is wrong with you? You're the problem. You're the problem. And I'm like, well, they're 12. Give them some time to grow up a little bit before See, we make boy. some big decision like that. But I have actually been att not physically attacked, but like people mad at me in my face about how wrong I am because of a teenager saying, yeah, I'm really this. And, and my response is, how well do you know that teenager compared to me? Maybe put a little credence in my thought and thinking and give me a little benefit of the doubt instead of just immediately, oh, they said it and you're wrong for not just immediately doing it. And it's like, chill out a little bit here. And me, I went, when I went to see Duran Duran, we didn't talk about concerts or anything, but right. you know, I, me and Adam were talking uh, about it and I'm like, you, you look at these people and it's like, okay. I'm not really a girl. I'm a boy, but I'm dating a boy. Okay. So is he gay? Well, no, he's not gay. Well, if you're a boy and he's a boy, that's gay, right? Well, no, he's not gay. No. So you're really a girl. No, I'm a boy. <laughs> oh my God. And I'm supposed to be the one at fault because this doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> yeah. But, but you know, it, so I'm sure there's so much interesting stuff going on here because there's all kinds of emotion and all yeah. kinds of science that are colliding here. Yes. Oh, absolutely. In, in same, like I've read multiple times that one of the reasons that we as a society have problems is because people aren't really themselves. They're full formed, stable self until they're like 25 years old. Yes. And yet we let them make decisions starting voting at 18 about alcohol at 21, about voting, about being in the military, about all kinds of things. And I think that letting people make permanent decisions when they're not fully formed human beings is a dangerous thing. I, when I, I don't know, youth, I always has had ways to protest and assert themselves and claim their body and claim their place in society and so forth. And so it's been long hair versus short hair back in the sixties. <laughs> it's been tattoos it's, it, and, and language youth always comes up with its own slang and so forth. But what's weird is that now we're making things that now it's not slang and it's kind of secret. Now it's assertive slang and everybody has to use it. Even though that, that it, I thought that part of the um, value of slang was that it's a secret language and that you can make the um, older fuddy duddies right. like, look foolish for not getting what you're trying to say. Where did cool come from? Where did fab Marv get your, you know what I mean? All the 60s. 70s all the he that she or he is my 
my bay, my um, best friend forever. Yes. My, there's all the things that come along. And so having said a whole bunch of those things that people get to choose when they're young, I think it's a little weird to have, you know, maybe part of being an adult is saying, you're not fully who you are yet. Maybe you shouldn't get a tattoo yet because you might at 25 have said, I don't know that Tweety Bird was the most important thing in my life to get put on my body forever. And even going beyond that, like sexuality is, it's not a matter of fashion. It's an immensely important, tricky, complex thing. Yeah. And someone saying, I really am a boy or a girl when their, their parts don't Fourteen. match that. It's a little tough to say, maybe you should give it a couple of years. I don't mean to extend your horror, your torture. Of course, I'm not wanting you to be feeling out of place in society and all that kind of stuff. But like, but I've known all kinds of people that were gay for a while, but not forever, that were straight for a while, but not forever. They experiment, they try things on. And like, you Figure can change your hairstyle, you can change your clothes, and the penalty is nothing. You just, right. in three months, your hair is different. If the next day, your clothes are different. You can put on eye contacts. You can, you can do all kinds of different piercings. And if you don't like them, you can like let that one go, move yeah. it elsewhere, let the whole clothes, whatever. But, but I wish that we had some sense of proportion as to that's a really big decision is getting a sex change when you're 12, yeah. as opposed to figuring it out when you're 25 and, and that you've had a little experience with. Do I like guys or gals or 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 none or both? Or you know what I mean? It, it's a, which, yeah, the rush to do it is combined with the cautionary really of our, our culture went from here a 180 extreme I, somebody should have said something about that before wait a minute i say it all the freaking time and we have such a big push for mental health nowadays which is wonderful more more noticeable more awareness less stigma attached to it and i've even talked about how the rise in depression and anxiety in the 20 year olds has grown by leaps and bounds by you know a quarter of what it, more than it was before but when we talk about transitioning and these issues with the sexuality that there's no crossover we're not looking at a kid's mental health and issues as much as I think sometimes we should if a kid has mental health problems in, me in many different fashions in different ways they've been in counseling they've acted out they've had these problems going on maybe that should be a signal to say why don't we investigate that a little bit before we just start jumping on the bandwagon and and i have started to see more and more stories come out of these kids 10 years down the line that have transitioned and said wow that was a huge mistake. I shouldn't have done that. And well, yes, you can transition so back, but it's not the same. And right. Right. I, I, like you said, you know, if I join the army, okay, the army's not for me. Well, now I got to suck it up, live through it. I can get out in four years. years. I'm good. Exactly. But College, still, it's a temporary thing. That's yeah. Right, That's a job, right. your hair, that even, even tattoos you can take off, but at least tattoos, my, you know, my cousin had a tattoo and he's like, yeah, I got that when I was drunk and I was like 16. Shouldn't have done it. You know? Right. But but it used to be that was just a story. Now it's a forever story. Now yes. it's like to explain why I got this right. Or and, whatever. Exactly. And then, but then you say things like, "Well, we should regulate and not let kids transition until a certain age." Well, you can't do that. That's someone else's body. You're controlling them. It's like, well, <laughs> but people are making stupid mistakes. Yeah. It, it, so segue time. So <laughs> the kid is not the only one involved there really is influence from the parents yes. and parents don't own their children, but they sure have responsibility for their children in very many ways, financially and socially and everything else. And so I, I wish that more parents kind of like had that conversation of, and it's kind of, you know, when you talked about mental health, I know that there's all kinds of terminology that's been associated with it's like sexual dysmorphia, right? Where you really don't feel you're in the right body, but you know what? That's not all different from, I don't think I'm tall enough, short enough, pretty enough. I don't, I don't like who I am. And in some cases, like, well, then if you want to be stronger, work out. If you want to be thinner, then run a little bit. And, it, and I make it sound so simple. Of course, but, it's not. Uh, but right. there are there's things that say it isn't always a drastic solution. Like if you're too tall, cut off your feet. No, no, you would never propose something like that. Right. And so whatever those things are of how. As kids are growing up and society is not kind, they've, it's never been kind to kids in terms of helping them find their place, helping them find who they are and understanding what motivates them. 
this is kind of weird. You and I are really smart guys. And yet when I think back to some of the things I did, I have to say, oh God, I was so young. You know what I mean? I took Story time. <laughs> ridiculous risks. I was unkind in, in ways well, that my mature self, my real self, yeah, would never think of doing nowadays. And yet I have to attribute that to quotes, the foolishness of youth. And I'm not talking 12, I'm talking 17 and 21. And up oh, until yeah. I was 25, and it might be that I still have some little impish guy in me that regularly says go ahead do it do it just try it do it and like maybe that's guys you know what i mean that they they make fun comedians make fun all the time of how guys are just like impulse machines that we just do whatever we want and then think of the consequences i would i would say it isn't guy gal it is kids aren't fully formed and don't have all the processing power don't have all the experience don't have all the data they don't have what it takes to make a huge decision. And that's why we don't let them vote yet. We don't let them have yes. at and different times has said, we're not going to make you act the adult when we know that you're not equipped to do so. And, and how many times swayed by that? You and, know and what I mean? So, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I I don't, I don't, how how you, many times do you hear and do you say it's like, oh, teenagers, all those hormones, right? You know, we, it, it's like, what do you do? That's just what they're doing. But you know, they say this, they get mad. It's like teenagers, I want to strangle them. But you know, it's because of their age and the hormones and their body's still adjusting. Oh, but they've decided that they're really a boy instead of a girl. That must be true. And there's no, no Wait, why question on it. Out? You don't really hate your mom, but some part of you being a young lady asserting herself in the world suddenly has to act as if nobody's more stupid than my mother. And like, and moms have to understand, boy, that's so hurtful, but it's just, like you said, their hormones talking, they're, they're lashing out because other things in their life aren't working, but I must be the source of them. Like, why would we give more credence to, I, I, I don't and, comfortable being the sex that I am, the gender that I am, as compared to all those other things that are like, you know, like, are, if you're a shoplifter, are you really a thief? No, you're kind of just trying on what, what would it be like to be lawless? What would it be like to just, I want this and so I got it. I, I don't know. I, I, There are youth crimes compared to adult crimes and even our courts struggle with that continually. Like sometimes, good Lord, this is terrible. You know, kids like we were playing a Halloween game and we stabbed somebody. It's like, well, I just well saw you, that still movie. Killed him. you still fucking killed them. And like right. so you try them as an adult because murder, you can't have a you know, worse crime than you took away that person's every future day. You really killed them. And so should they be, we're going to let them off because they were kid and didn't know what they were doing. Like, I, I don't, I don't know. There are some things that are so terrible, so egregious that it's not just, Hey, it was a fun thing that got out of hand, but it was calculated and evil and really a crime. And they're an old soul in the young body. And their old soul is a fucking devil. It really is evil. And I don't know it's that a- we can bring them back out because you know, if you don't punish them, they think it's permission sometimes. Yeah. And I'm making sweeping statements, sweeping statements. Nothing matters more than all the, there's contingencies, there's circumstances that go with every one of these things. And so that's why, of course, changing your sex is not murder, but the mental thing that's going on as to how we as a society judge whether kids are equipped to make those kinds of decisions. There are examples all around us in the way that you were just saying, we're going to let all the other mental health things be People are still involved, doctors and parents and priests and everybody else. But about sex, nope, they get, nope, it's, yes. <laughs> that's, that, they get, I've the... <laughs> had that argument. <laughs> about and, gender? And, about... <laughs> yeah, I've had that argument. And, you know, like, it's the feel like one. We're going to, we're going to let them be cavalier about like one of the trickiest things in the world. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sexuality is amazingly complex. And, 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 <laughs> and you mentioned about the crimes and stuff. Uh, it's funny too, because we, we talk about, people maturing at different years, different levels, different places in their life, you know, right. and it's like, okay, you better commit that crime today. Cause you're still a kid, but tomorrow's your 18th birthday. And uh, then right. you, you'll know different. You get out of jail free car yeah. instead of being, yeah, you're going to be fully tried as an adult. Right. Oh, man. Yeah. I, again, but <laughs> it, it's a, it's a rough thing. And to, you know, very easy for somebody to hear a clip of our talk or part of it and just go off. Cause Oh, you guys don't understand, or you guys are against trans people. Not at all. You you know how many 
gay and trans people I've dealt with over the last couple of years because of my kids, because of society. Over the weekend when I was at the author event, the, the one running it was Devin, a boy or girl name. I wasn't sure. Well, okay. I still am not sure. <laughs> Let's just okay. say that. But I didn't have a problem with them. Dude, if you want to do that, go ahead. I'm good with, with you. But they were also like 30 years old. <laughs> you know, there's right. a difference between 14 and 30 in your thinking and your life and, and all of that. So I hear you. That's uh, <laughs> this. I Like I said, this has been a very interesting discussion. And I really hope that people listen to it all the way through instead of what's the pull quote that I can use so that I can jump on whatever I want to say about the certainty that I have. Right. This, I'll say that this is. What did I just read or see that one of the worst things that we have in our society is people are certain about things about which you can't be and about which they, like they don't even try to become uncertain. They don't give themselves that. It's so uncommon to have to know a thing for sure. You know, maybe two plus two equals four, but about all these complex issues for them to rush to judgment, rush to certainty, it is a, a real damaging thing. When someone says, this is what I think, and you can't change my mind. I don't really care about what we're talking about, the issue. I care about, I know that you are lost, that you are the kind of person that is not looking to learn more, that will not let the world teach them things in refutation of what they came to when they were 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 or 70. That like, don't you keep always taking in information and having that Doubt is a really helpful thing. What, what, what happened to the <laughs> good old days? <laughs> what happened to the good old days where we just argued of Apple versus PC or Jagger versus whoever, Billy Joel or whatever, right. you know, <laughs> you know, I like PlayStation, you like Xbox, let's fight, you know, where <laughs> there's those good old days. Right. <laughs> so. I, so I know we're, I know we're almost like, so yeah, yeah. really over. Yeah. Here's a cool thing I got out of Wired real quick. Yeah. The, the world that a big difference in the generations that we've talked about is not necessarily age and music and taste and stuff. It's the idea of batch versus loop. That there's a certain group of people that like they start something and they end something. They do things on a project basis or they just think of that it's a discrete thing. And there's a certain group of people and they and society has grown up with certain people that have always thought this way that everything is an event loop that you step in and out of something that's continually running and you tap into it and then you come back out of it. You don't initiate it. You don't really even have the ability to stop it. You participate for a while. And so it's how we do our music, how we do our streaming. It's how we live our lives. If people don't really think I'm going to make a plan and follow that plan to its conclusion, and then I'll make another plan that they're thinking in a different way, that there's continually choices to be made and, there isn't really a sign that those choices change the way the world is around them. And, and like, I, I think I have both, interestingly, because being a computer guy, the computer world changed from being in batch mode to being in event loop mode. You know what I mean? Right. Learning how to use C++, learning how to do Macintosh programming, and that the computer is always waiting for you to participate with it instead of you put a deck of cards in and run it, and then it's done, and you look at the results. And the tighter that we got that return loop, or the more that we said, there really are demons and D-A-E-M-O-Ns running in the background that are always waiting for, are you going to print something? Are you going to print something? Are you going to print something? Like, a print queue existed for you to throw things onto it, not that you sent the printer a job. Right. You know what I mean? All those kinds of things. And by being having a foot in both camps, I can understand the value of each of them and that I do different things in my life on that basis. So what I take on as a project and what I just kind of keep participating and then stepping out of. And I think if you don't have both, if you only think with the event loop and you can't think of, it really is worth having a start point and an end point. And that, if you have only the start point and end point, but you don't get the idea of, well, I should learn from what I just did. And then the next thing I take on, you build in a feedback loop. So you do it better. I, I thought that was a big enough thought that it starts to help us talk about not only generational things like we were talking about. Oh, they're just different. They, it's because the world that we're growing up in, your phone versus your desktop computer versus an old batch computer it's been generationally different and the way in which people participate in those things is affecting their lives. It's affecting how their mind works. You know, just like when you watch TV, you think the way the TV wants you to watch, we're amusing ourselves to death. You start to think of, if I see, I, 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 
there's a great book called Amusing Ourselves to Death that first made this big point to me. You watch the news and you say, wow, a whole bunch of people died in an earthquake. And then the sports scores come on and they each get two minutes. Right. Like, wow, I guess those sports scores are just as important as a thousand people dying. And the way that we do those things, where do we put our time? And, and what's the emphasis that's put on things? What's the way that the world cares about things? Every time that I go through my uh, Google or Apple or Facebook news feed, and I see really important breakthrough in material science so that now we can do this. And then here's the celebrity couple breakup of the week. And right. they give the same amount of column inches and the same, and like, God damn it, they aren't as important. Is there a way that I can participate in saying, mm -hmm. give me more of what really matters and less of what's crap? The only way I can seem to do it is a little bit of canceling. I get rid of all the golf news. Golf news will never matter to me. And you know what I mean? Right. Celebrity breakup news. Like the latest celebrity breakup was two people I'd never even heard of. And so it's like, wow, they're celebrities that I've never heard of. And now they're breaking up is an important thing. And it's like, that's just so ridiculous to me. Yeah. This is news. It's news. But, but on the flip side, the, the news media wants to get so sensationalized so the only thing we start to hear about is every single cop car chase and every single shooting and 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 it makes it seem like that that's all that's happening you know there there's it's such a thing that could be evaluated and these are the problems and each one leads to a different problem and that's right. you know there's multiple layers to that whole onion <laughs> another thing that amusing ourselves to death talks about is that sensational thing especially the violence thing that if you watch that all the time you get a feeling that all around me there is always crime and always mayhem going on and they even include that in our commercials now for state farm or is it all state i forget how effective a commercial is it that i can't remember who it was that has that so just like benson and hedges but anyway you know what i mean like th th to talk about how you have to be your own person that's deciding what to consume because if you watch the nightly news and you read these news sources and they are always about what's wrong with the world instead of what's right then that's you're always looking to be yeah. something's wrong with the world i'm going to join in that criticism i'm going to find out what's wrong with me and instead it, it really is okay to say yeah. Every time I take a walk, it seems that kids are having fun and dogs are having fun right. and I'm having fun and this is a beautiful world. And maybe that's a good thing to make sure you include in your life. There you are know? no blue BMWs on the road until you're looking for blue BMWs and then that's all you see. <laughs> that's if, right. If, if, you know, the the shootings, the, the politician problems, if that's what you, and worse is the algorithms feed that. So instead of you just That's noticing right. it with your own brain filter, you've got little bot filters. Of, oh, they clicked on the politician one. Let's send them more politician news. Oh, right. they clicked on two of the politician ones because that's all that we sent them. Oh, that, and then you think, well, that's all, the only news there is. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for letting me get that last little bit in there. Yes, no man. No, it's so been far. great. Yeah, no problem. Man. <laughs> all right. So we didn't really talk about music and I'm sure we'll have plenty of things to talk about, but maybe. Grand uh, we'll Duran Project. Hey, tune in next week because I'm seeing George Thorgood. Then we're seeing Jim Gaffigan. We got a whole bunch of good stuff. We, uh, we got comedy coming up at the end of the month and i'll even do like a not a live on-site thing but definitely i'll be doing a podcast in between while we're there tuesday because it'll be so much fun to say who have we seen who's right. great who are new discoveries all that kind of stuff how much right. is toronto a beautiful city etc okay it is it's, it's not right. too far away i mean you know that's right it's it's what, what, what it, i love it i love the fact that we have this world-class comedy festival like five hours away yeah. i don't need to go to jamaica <laughs> you know what i mean so which right. would be kind of cool too which know? would be okay too that'd be, great that'd be more place. the blues festival so oh yeah all, all right, right man talk to you later care, Stephen. okay bye-bye